This week's episode is brought to you by Campaign Refinery, an amazing new email marketing automation tool. Look, in the world of digital marketing, there's a lot to keep track of. We all know this. As much as we're in love with social media and the power of social conversation here at Social Inc. and on the All About Digital Marketing podcast, we are well aware at just how powerful email marketing can be. Email marketing is not dead. In fact, it's never been more important to help you leverage your presence everywhere else into the one channel that you'll own, regardless of what changes Facebook, Twitter, or any other platform makes in the future. I've known the founder, Travis Ketchum, for years, and he's been a past guest on the podcast, episode 15, if you want to listen to it. I've personally used his other products before, and they've been fantastic. The amount of thought that he's put into each and every one of what he's created has been incredible. I'd highly encourage you to try their free 14-day trial at campaignrefinery.com to see what world-class email marketing automation can do for you and your business. Massive thank you to Travis and Campaign Refinery for their support of the All About Digital Marketing show. Welcome to the All About Digital Marketing podcast. The show all about digital marketing, digital marketing, digital marketing, Digital marketing. Brought to you by Social Inc., a digital marketing agency specializing in social media and content marketing for brave brands and forward thinking SMEs. I'm your host, Chris Bruno, and as always, we're here to bring you the most actionable tips, tricks, tools, and insights to help you achieve more when it comes to your digital marketing. Subscribe to the show and be sure to share with a friend if you found something useful or interesting. You can find all the show notes and more information on www.allaboutdigitalmarketing.co.uk. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the All About Digital Marketing podcast. As you may have already realized, we like to repurpose content and Social Inc. has been creating the Social Inc. show for the last couple of months. Today's episode is The Social Inc. Show, episode three. We love doing this because it's a really simple format. It's James O'Donnell, commercial director, and myself, CEO and founder of Social Inc., simply having a chat about things that are going on, things that have come up for us over the course of the month, and things that we're interested in developing ideas for clients, for ourselves, and different ways in which we can work. We hope you enjoy the episode. Please do leave us feedback on any of the social media channels. You can find us at All About Digmar, D I G M A R, and let us know if you like these episodes. Enjoy, stay safe, and we'll speak soon. Ba, ba, ba. Social Link Show, let's do it. Episode three. We still don't have any interesting or good opening credits yet. So we're well, really upset. For the feed- thanks for the feedback. No, 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 no. You've done some, I've done some. We've made some opening credits. But what we really wanted was to try and get somebody out there that would have been like that. Cool. I'll get a little bit of exposure. I'll make a really cool little intro for you professionally. It looks good. Uh, And that would have been absolutely awesome because that would allow us to obviously promote the hell out of them. So if you're listening, if you do any kind of video animation or if you're good at that kind of stuff and you just want to get it out there, feel free to let us know. We do need some opening credits that would be good. Can I caveat that? Even if you're not good at it and you want to give it a go, I'd love to see what you can do because you can only get better by giving things a go. And we'll share it as well and we'll use it just in case anyway, just to help you guys out. So why not? Definitely. So what are we talking about today, James? Uh, well, we're just going to chat, aren't we? Sorry, I had to just let you finish your little sip of coffee in between there. Okay, cool. Well, there's something that I wanted to ask you about today. And I want to talk about this because actually this is how we met, in fact, many, many years ago now. I think five, coming up to six years ago nearly. Yeah, you were a lot less salt and pepper. Wow. I think that's ageist. I'm just going to scribble down a few notes to send to HR. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just a tough, tough lockdown. (laughs) Something like that. Let's go with that. Um, but we met because of a outreach program that you were doing at the time when you were working with uh, your previous employer. And outreach I wanted program to- the way that you just described that sounds like we were kind of helping people. 
like we were doing kind of outreach to people that are in need like community service of some sort yeah, and that's why yeah, you ended yeah. up spending time with yeah. me i found we found chris he was in dire need we we out we did some outreach to him and now look at him thriving thank you james indeed well so the idea behind this was actually what i wanted to ask you was a little bit about how you do outreach on linkedin and before we get started on that what actually is LinkedIn outreach? And I don't think a lot of people get this and I don't think a lot of people really understand the power of what it can be. Uh, and I'm sure during this conversation, we'll talk a little bit about the fact that I've recently been replying to people about how bad their outreach has been. But from your point of view, what is LinkedIn outreach? So LinkedIn outreach is the way to systematically use LinkedIn as a way of building your network for the purposes of getting you in front of people, getting you in front of your audience. So a lot of people use LinkedIn blindly, to be honest. You, as you say, Chris, we receive hundreds of people that just send invites every single day, have no idea why they're reaching out there we've got no mutual connections it's just a blank invite that we receive via linkedin the idea of linkedin outreach is that you you define your niche and then you send personalized invitations to people to to connect that you have a mutual reason why there is that, that you might be talking to each other that might be that you're in the same group as each other that you have got mutual connections that you're in the same sector that you like the product that they're doing and you can actually justify why you like it, not just, I really liked your website, and that you can actually have, have an interaction. And then over the course of the algorithm, and it depends on this a little bit, but probably between eight and 12 weeks, you just interact with that person as a human being. You might send them a message. You might share some content with them. You might comment on some of the content that they're sharing and the idea is that whilst you're doing that they're getting to know you a little bit you're getting to know them a little bit and eventually you get to a point where the natural relationship has developed there that you then might have a zoom coffee in the olden days we met for a coffee didn't we chris <laughs> i feel like i haven't gone out to meet anyone for a coffee in a very very long time <laughs> And, and the idea of that is that, so that initial coffee is very much a meeting of mutuals. So it's, I'm interested in what you're doing. You're interested in what, what I'm doing and let's see where the relationship might go. Now, at no point during any of that, are there, is there a sales conversation? It's not instant. Oh, hi, uh, by the way, I'm selling this. Do you want to buy it? It's a natural way of introducing yourself to someone as you might do in a, in a normal social environment. I think this is the main thing, what you've just said there. People have forgotten that if you were face-to-face, -face, you would not start a conversation by saying, hi, James, I'm Chris. You should buy XYZ because of ABC. Kind regards. See ya. And people have really forgotten that. And it's becoming, <laughs> I don't want to say a pet hate of mine, but I'd say I'm getting pitched between six and eight times a week. And I've started replying to people. Uh, and I'd like to look at it as some constructive criticism towards to helping them maybe for the future. And mainly basically telling them, you know, one of two things. One, you haven't read who I am, what I do, or who we are in any way, shape or form. So you're pitching me something that is completely a non-starter. Uh, an example was this week, uh, earlier this week, so I think it was on Monday, I got an email from somebody saying, we can reduce your finance department overheads by 50%. Now, we're a small organization. We have four members of our core team. We work with freelancers. But the one thing we definitely do not have is a finance department. We have an amazing accountant who's been great to us and really helps us look after ourselves. But our main cost is zero as a platform to help us make sure that we carry on and keep our accounts in order. So again, straight away. Sorry. Is that zero or zero? Zero, zero. with an X. Zero. From New Zealand? 
from New Zealand. Um, but the idea being, right, so that the, the connection request and the pitch is almost completely wasted. Well, not almost, it's 100% completely wasted. So not only have I gone, right, you connected with me, you pitched on the connection request, you pitched me a service that has absolutely nothing to do with what we actually need, like in any way, shape or form. So now I've got a connection request that's sat there and I'm looking at it going, I don't even see the point. And it's not just with this one. There's others as well that have seen, you know, we've worked quite a lot in the blockchain space back in 2018. We helped a lot of companies out during that time to help market themselves. But it's not something that we do. But I get pitched probably twice a week for if you need blockchain development services, we're here to help you. And again, I'm sat there going, you haven't read who we are or what we do or what I do or what our company does, because in no way, shape or form do we need that. But fundamentally, I think what would be great you mentioned it earlier a second ago, you know, it's an eight to 12 week process of getting to know someone, right? And I talk about this a lot in the sense of for social media, when we talk about putting the social back into social media, it's a little bit like dating, right? You need to meet someone, you need to get to know them, you need to interact with them, you need to spend some time with them, you need to slowly build that. You don't go on a first date, walk in and go, hey, you're awesome, let's get married, have two kids, and then we'll move to the south of France. Like it, it just doesn't work that way. And I think people forget that because we're online. It's as if the rules of social interaction get forgotten. And I think especially when it comes to LinkedIn, where everyone's like that, yeah, it's a business platform. That's what it's there for. So I should just copy paste a message to a thousand people and hope to dear God that one person goes, yeah, that's really good. And I think the question for you would be, how much time is being wasted, no matter how quick or how automated that process is, but how much time is being wasted by just hammering that rather than identifying people that would be a good connection? And the second part of that is the results must be shocking as a percentage. The results are pretty poor. I, I do know people that use the, that approach and LinkedIn are getting very switched on to that and are blocking people that are just sending blanket invites to people. Because you can say, I don't know this person, and those, that, that blocks those people from, from doing that. The sad thing, though, is that for a lot of these businesses, it does work. It's, it's almost like spam mail. Back in the day, you know, if you sent 10,000 emails out and you got one sale, you don't care about the other 9,999 9, that you've annoyed. It's still worth it for that one sale. Is it, though, a way of delivering long-term business and building a good reputation? Probably not. So it's a, it might be a good short-term result for the salesperson, but long-term, it doesn't help the business. So that's one thing about whether or not it, it, it works or not. To answer your second point, what was it? I can't remember. <laughs> Well, I think you answered the second point before answering the first point. What was the first point? So the first point was the idea of actually just hammering out these messages and what an absolute waste of time it's got to be. Yeah, the yeah, results yeah. part was the second point, and I think you mentioned that. But even just then, you know, you mentioned it there in terms of the branding side of things, in terms of who you get seen as, uh, in terms of even, you know, the knock-on effects. So a lot like back in the day when people bought email address lists and hammered out that spam email. What happened invariably was the spam filters and stuff got more intelligent. People started marking things as this is spam, this is spam, this is spam. And literally that kind of became a non-starter. Like we still get them today. People have scraped our podcast email address and they add them to a list and we get crappy emails trying to sell us stuff. And it says, please reply with unsubscribe. And you're like that, this is spam 101, right? This is literally, you're doing something that's badly done. It's awful. It shouldn't be done that way. But again, it goes straight into the spam box. And to be honest with you, before I used to kind of reply to, to some of them, but if it goes into spam now, I'm literally just like that, right, gone, delete, I don't care, keep it marked as spam and good luck to the people. But it's because of bad, bad actors. And I think the same thing is happening more and more on LinkedIn, which is a shame because it could be an amazing platform to help people network. And especially in 2020, where, like you said, you know, we're not going to networking events. We're not going to conferences. We're not meeting people at other social events. So actually, this is a really good way to start building relationships. But people seem to have missed the building part and want to get straight to the finished house. What do you think about this? 
most of these invites that I'm getting are not from the business owner. They are from a salesperson that is, has either been hired as an agency salesperson or is in their sales team that is, is trying to do sales. And I think there's a very different motivator that's happening there. The salesperson is looking to get a sale so that they can get commission, sale, commission, sale, commission. Whereas a business owner, when they're networking, when they're building connections, they are naturally going to be thinking more long-term for the, for the business so that when they do interactions, it is more social, it is more interactive with the, with the people in their network. So I'll get into a little bit of nostalgia for a second. We could do some effects. Ooh. Keep saying that, and our effects are very, very basic still, but I'm okay with that. We're getting. I really liked my segue. Yeah. <laughs> It was back in 2007. I went for a job interview with Honda in the UK and the role was for business development for corporate cars. So basically getting cars into businesses as their their fleet. And I remember being in the very first interview and the sales manager for the dealership, I think I was in Enfield actually, around your old, uh, old stomping grounds, And anyway, we had this chat and the guy said to me, you know, as a salesperson, what is your most effective tool? And I was like that, wow, like deep question. So in my head, I'm thinking tools, what do I have? I was like that, well, you know, ability to to build relationships, uh, to develop those relationships over time to make sure they're long lasting, stuff like that. Because in my head, that's always been the core principle. And uh, the guy said to me, no. Okay, let's see where this is going. He pulled out the yellow pages, threw it on the table in front of me, said, that's your best tool. And I was like that. Okay. Can you expand on this? Cause I'd love to understand more. And I thought this is going to be fun. As the guy went through the yellow pages, he was literally open to page one a, and just started going, right, here you go. There's 10 businesses right there that you could call today and that you could have meetings with and that you could then go and see. And I was like that. Yeah, I could of which, you know, your first 10 meetings are going to include 35, 40 miles of driving backwards, forwards, left, right, center, up and down, and one thing or another. And a lot of them potentially are going to be four members of staff, no corporate cars, small company, mum and pups, uh, a florist who, you know, don't deliver, don't have any corporate vehicles or fleets or anything else. And in my head, it was this massive reminder of being back in recruitment. And I know you've been in recruitment as well. And being told by my manager at the time, the way this works is you need to make 600 calls a week. From those 600 calls a week, you will get 10 jobs on. From those 10 jobs on, we'll try and place people. But literally, it's going to be one placement. And you're looking at those numbers going, so I make 600 calls to potentially get 10 jobs, to potentially get one placement. And in and amongst that process, build zero relationships with anyone really, except for maybe the one guy who gets placed or the one girl who gets placed. That's going to be the best relationship. And that's, you know, weeks of work to potentially build one relationship. And it reminded me so much of that. And I think people have taken that hardcore salesman role from the 80s and they've brought it all the way into 2020 and they've completely ignored any changes that have happened in between. Right. The ability for the proof today, you know, companies like Google, like Facebook, some of the biggest powerhouses in the world are all working remotely, are all doing what we're doing, video chats and conversations, whether it be on Zoom or FaceTime or whatever else. And literally they are creating or continuing to build their businesses by doing these sorts of things. And none of those involve, you know, taking the phone book out and hammering every number in there, trying to hopefully catch a sale and save your business. So I think what's the, the real, what's the reality of LinkedIn today and as a sales tool, how can people use LinkedIn in an effective way? So I think it's twofold. There's the direct outreach to people who are active, who are in your network that match the ideal customer that you're, that you're trying to get in front of. And then it's also having content 
that is consistently going out, that aligns with your messaging, that means that when you're connecting with someone, there's a, there's a, a congruence of the type of conversations that you're, that you're having. And then what you'll find, and what we certainly find doing the outreach that we do, is that with content and direct messaging aligned, people qualify themselves in. They, they reach out back to us to say, this is what I want you to do for, for me. They see that we are producing content. They see that we do direct outreach. And they see that we can grow the business that way. And they want to do it for themselves. And particularly now, with the way that digital platforms means that you can be in front of your ideal customer almost every single day is incredibly powerful. So back in the 80s, your sales manager or the owner of that business could not speak to every single business that was currently looking for a car. They couldn't pick up the phone quick enough, which is why they needed to employ loads of Chris Brunos to jump on the phone and do all those phone calls. That was the only way that you could get in front of all of those people as often as you possibly can. And there's a lot of businesses that are now are still stuck, as you say, in that mindset. Whereas the smart businesses realize that we can actually get our best salesperson, who is normally the business owner, who's got the, the motivation, they've got the story, they know the product inside out, they, they care long term about the business they've now got the ability to get that person in front of their ideal customer every single day and you do that through a combination of of outreach and content if you had to give anybody watching this hi everyone if you had to give them just one thing that they could do today to radically improve the way they do outreach on linkedin what would that be when you connect with someone Make it a personal connection. Don't copy and paste your invite. Look at the person, look where they're working, and give a reason why you want to connect with them. And that reason should not be, I want to build my network. It needs to be specific and personal to that individual. Awesome. I love it. So, what's up next? I saw an interesting post the other day and it was, I think it was attributed to Elon Musk, but I don't know if it was actually him that said it. And it was about how people should help small business owners more. And it got me thinking about how, how you can help small business owners more in this crazy new world that we live in. So it's a huge, well, hugely debated subject, and it's been talked about by thousands and millions of people, probably. It's this idea that most people don't actually support their friends' small businesses. And this sounds crazy, right? So they'll share the latest clip from Beyonce. They'll repost stuff from Kylie Jenner or whoever. But their local business owner friends, they won't necessarily share or help to get that message out there or even interact and engage with those brands online. And I think today, the world that we're living in 2020, you know, it's being more and more pumped out there that small business owners are going to really struggle this year. Uh, City centers aren't coming back yet to what they used to be. People are talking about it from restaurant point of view. Uh, You know, the government's push to, to help out, eat out all of these kind of things. And I think one of the biggest things that people could actually do to make a change and to help is that any small businesses that you, you do like, so whether it be, you know, a small cafe, and I give that as an example, because I've got some very good friends who have uh, the Greenwood Cafe up in Telford um, near the Iron Bridge, beautifully set in uh, some woodlands area. And they make a real effort to, to really engage, get to know their customers. It's a fairly small area, but they know lots of the people that come in. But they also ask those people to get involved and to really sort of be part of what they're trying to do. And what happens as a result of that is that their customers are there for them. 
their customers are there to help them. And in fact, they had customers ask them if whilst they were on lockdown, they would be doing gift cards or anything else to be able to help support the business. And I mean, that's what you're really looking for, right? That hugely engaged audience that really love you and help you and want to help you. And I think one of the biggest things that's Uh, that's available to people today is helping out a small business can be as little as helping to share and promote their messaging. We're all on Facebook. We're all on LinkedIn. We're all on Twitter. Everyone's got a platform of choice where they spend time and they'll share the latest article about Elon Musk's new Neuralink uh, and what's going to be happening in that space, which is hugely interesting. And then they'll just gloss over, you know, the small independent pub that they like to go to who are really struggling at the moment, right? They're not making money like they used to, and it's going to be a tough time. And actually helping those small businesses out has an enormous impact in comparison to sharing a big brand stuff. Big brands, they've got their cupboards, they're, they're covered, right? They've got huge outreach, they've got huge budgets, they can keep spending money, and they've also got cash reserves that a lot of small businesses just don't have. And the impact of, you know, a like, a share here, a comment, a little bit of support, helping those brands and celebrating those brands, especially if they are friends of yours or people that you know or anything like that, can have a huge impact. And I think today, this year, 2020, it's even more crucial that people do that. And I think the post that you were sharing about the idea of like a a business shower, like a baby shower, uh, to help celebrate that, I think more people should take it not take it for granted that actually, great, you know, James has started a business or James and Chris run their own business, who cares? But actually thinking about it from the other side, which is James and Chris have taken a huge risk, right, to run their own business. They don't get a solid income from from an employer. They're not sat there taking, you know, their four weeks holiday and it's all great and cushy and everything's gravy because they own their own business. It's the opposite, right? They're taking huge risks. They're people that are willing to build something over the long term. They're willing to take sacrifices when things go bad and, and celebrate the wins when things go well. But actually any support and help that you can offer that small business has a huge, huge impact. And I think a lot of people overlook that, right? They just kind of go, well, you know, James and Chris are doing fine, as an example. Or the cafe was always really busy back in the day, so who cares? And actually, to try and understand that at the moment, in 2020, things are going to be tough for everybody. And actually, those little aiding support, a little message here, a little like there, a little share there, can have a huge, huge impact. And I think that's really important. Yes, the, I see what you mean there about business owners you know, they have done something special. By starting something, you know, there's there's the potential there that you can employ more people as the business grows and you can share the success of that business. And everyone thinks, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's great. But the the example is always, you've used Beyonce there. I don't know why Beyonce is always used, but people always, when people speak about independent bands, People always buy the latest Beyonce album, but if their friend releases an album, they won't necessarily buy it. Whereas, you know, every purchase there really makes a difference to that, to that individual. If someone goes to the extent, the risk to start a YouTube channel, to share any kind of content, you know, they're taking a risk. They're, they're being vulnerable and they're, they're, try, they're trying to do something. They're trying to, to change their, their, where they are in, 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 in the world. You know, the easy thing to do is go and get a job and clock in nine to five, whereas starting a business should be, celebra- should be celebrated. And maybe there's something, I think when you start one, when you start a business, yeah, everyone, all your friends should get behind and, have something to kind of give it, give it a boost. But then maybe every year when that birthday of that business comes around, there should be something where, where, it's, where it's boosted as well. And maybe there's something that business owners could do to facilitate that to happen. So if you want to support us as a business, this is a really great way of doing it. So, for example, not everyone's going to want to have a social media package with us. You know, some people are in jobs and they, they, they've got no side hustle and they, they've got no business and they, 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 they're not going to be our customers. But the way that they could help us is 
they could like the content. They could comment on the content in, with non sarky comments about my sunglasses or my baldness or Chris's salt and pepper. You know, there's, there's things that they can do to facilitate that. And maybe there's a way that business owners should make it easy for their friends and family to, to support them. So I think, and I'm thinking about our friends and family, and I'm thinking if we ran a wine business, our friends and family would love everything that we did. Yes. So I think it's always challenging, right? And I, I don't want it to be talking just about us, but I think it is really important that people do recognize, you know, if a friend has started something, give them some support. Uh, and I was listening to the Victory podcast uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what it is, it's the entourage creator, Doug Ellen, who started a podcast and he's basically bringing on some of the actors. He's doing it with Kevin Dillon and Kevin Connolly, who were two of the actors that played two of the main characters, Johnny Drama and E. And basically they're just talking about uh, the different episodes, things that happen behind the scenes, the friendship, the relationship that they all built up and stuff like that. But what was really interesting, they were talking about this the other day and saying that Doug Ellen was saying, you know, any of his friends, if they post something, they get a like. Just that's the way he is. You know, if you're putting yourself out there, it doesn't matter whether it's your photo of your breakfast or whether it's, you know, news about a next job that one of the actors has got, whatever it is, he supports them by giving them a like. And when you think about it, it's that. That is the level of support that you're basically asking your friends and family to give you. It's literally when you see the post, double tap to like. That's it. That, that is the most basic form of how you can support some small business that's out there. And what was really interesting, they were talking about it, and it's Kevin Connolly, uh, who played E in the series, who's like that. I'm not liking your, uh, your, your lunch photos or your, or your breakfast photo. I'm not doing that. He goes, I'll like stuff if it has something that I resonate with or it really makes sense to me or anything like that. And I understand that principle, right? There are lots of people out there that are like that. Look, I don't care about social media or I'm not really too bothered about the cafe that a friend started because it's not near me and I can't go to it every day or anything like that. But actually taking time to recognize the effort and the, the, the heartache that somebody puts into running a business and giving them a little bit of a boost. So I do like stuff that our clients post, that our friends post, that people out there are trying to actually put out there. I will say congrats to somebody and not use the LinkedIn automated message of a friend celebrating an 11 year anniversary like he was the other day. I think that's important right? You're keeping in touch with that network, but you're also, I want to encourage everybody in whatever that they're doing. And I think lots of people don't realize just how big an impact getting those few extra likes, getting those few extra comments, getting those few extra subscribers and like counts and whatever else can actually have on a small business. And I think that's something that, again, you know, if you've got a friend who's running a business, doesn't matter what it is, even if it's something that you can't really buy, share it with your network. It's not going to hurt you. It's going to help them enormously. And I think actually if everyone did that a little bit more, small businesses right now might be finding themselves slightly less hung by the noose um, and a little bit more just feeling good, getting the message out there. And again, you know, you'll know, share stuff from the big brands. The big brands don't really need that. They're going to be fine. But the small business owners that you know and the small business owners that are struggling right now, they really do need your support and your help. I think the term that we're looking at looking for here is social media capital you know you've got a thousand likes in your pocket and you can use those every day and where you spend that it's free to do but where you spend that is kind of where you're throwing your support absolutely i've got a a distant cousin who i last met in 99 i think a couple 19, of years ago 1999 it, in australia and he runs a convenience store for a small town called Wollumbai right in the sticks and i follow their facebook page and every time they put up a post i give it a, i give it a little like Absolutely. Because that, that's the only way I can support this convenience store. That is, I don't know how far away Australia is, the other, so, the other side of the world. And I just feel that's, that's, that's me sending a little bit of my social media capital that way to give it a boost. Yeah, and I think it's huge, right? Because even, 
even psychologically, right, for them when they're putting stuff out there and they see that there's people supporting and they'll see the regular updates and notifications from friends, family, customers, you know, their hardcore fans. And even though it might not help them financially because you can't physically be buying from their store or anything else, but, you know, if your friend opened that business and it was down the street from you, chances are you would go to them, right? You would make an effort to say, right, every now and again, I'll pop in and I'll buy something because, you know, I'm helping them. And whether I buy it from there or I buy it from the shop next door makes no difference to me. So I'd like to help them. And online is the same thing. It's the same principle, even if you can't buy. But like you said, you're giving that capital away to big brands to big companies to big publications to youtubers that you watch or whatever it might be and actually you don't take into account that you know anyone that's a small business owner any one of your friends who's taken that risk who's trying they're pouring their heart and soul into it let's be honest 99 percent of all the business owners we know are killing themselves to try and make this work they work long hours and everything else and pretty super much passionate all, super passionate about yeah absolutely and most of them will usually end up saying, if we get into this conversation, we'll say, you know, the, the least support comes from the people closest to you. And I think that's really kind of shocking. So you get clients that buy into you, that love what you do and everything else, and that comment and share and like and talk. And, you know, they're really involved and engaged with you. And actually, funnily enough, the people that know you the best or that know you the longest, there's no kind of communication whatsoever. There's no show of support or anything else. So I think that's something that a lot of people could do, and especially in 2020, where small businesses really need help. Show support, even if it's not financial, but show support on social media to the small business owners, to the independents, to the coffee shop you know, down the street that you've been to a couple of times. They're going to need it more than ever before. Indeed, Rooney. We'll come up with an Indeed, Rooney. Uh, comic book Ooh. looking yeah comic book looking pam um awesome so chris one of the things that we've been speaking about is the difference between a business shouting about its product and being social and engaging and human online and the differences of that because i think correct me if i'm wrong but I think everybody knows that in sales, in business, people buy from people. Does everyone know that? I don't know. So people buy from people. If, if everybody knows that, why do some businesses therefore not put their people in front of their potential customers? Because if you're trying to sell, this is old school sales now, Chris, but if you're trying to sell a pen and you just do features, advantage, benefits of this pen, it's got a lid, it is black, it has got that, that, that you know, and you just talk about the pen, it's like, meh. Whereas if you say, hi, my name's James, I built, I've started this pen company because I think that more people need to be able to write, to share stories and to interact with their loved ones via um, an old school medium called letter writing all of a sudden there's a story there's a narrative that people can buy into and it doesn't matter how boring i'm all of a sudden i'm quite attached to my pen now but it doesn't matter what the product is adding a human element to it makes it more appealing that's why all the you know adverts when you see them on television they're happy Family, smiley people living in, you know, non-COVID, touchy-feely world. So the rant about this is about people. If people know this, if people understand that people buy from people, my challenge, my mission is to get more business owners to share their story, to step out of their comfort zone, turn the camera on, throw a selfie up and share the story about their business. Don't obsess over the product that you're trying to sell. Tell your story and share your narrative. So there's a few things here. One, I genuinely thought you were going to go Wolf of Wall Street on me and uh, do the whole sell me this pen. If we were going to go Wolf of Wall Street, I would have done some vodka martinis and started early. Uh, um absolutely agree with you right did you know that was a made-up thing 
It was improvised, yeah. He just added it in. And well, it was because that's what, of his that's what he does. Training. That's, that's yeah, what yeah. he does, yeah. Brilliant. When he's warming up before he starts. Anyway, we're getting into films now. The There's two things, right, on that. One, I agree with you completely. People obsess over the product and forget about the audience, forget about their why, forget about why they wanted to actually start the company in the first place. Because the reality is if you are selling pens, you didn't start a pen company with the idea of, I just want to sell lots of pens. You're starting a pen company because you honestly are linked to that product in some way. And there'll be some reason that you want to do it. You love writing, you love calligraphy, you love whatever it might be. And that reasoning to, to kind of bring it through, or you might just feel like, you know, it's a, it's a lost art, right? I'm going to be the first one to admit, I try and scribble notes down uh, to journal on a daily basis on paper and pen. My handwriting is getting, well, it's just gone to, to, to absolute, it's terrible. I'm not going to swear. I'm trying not to swear. Um, but the idea being that, you know, it's a lost art and that might be one of the reasons why you want to do it. And why one of the reasons why you want to bring it in. But the biggest thing that we found is that a lot of companies from the top down, even when they get to a certain size and they've got staff and they've got staff members and they've got sales teams, and they've got all of this, they're not encouraging it at any level. And what's really scary is, you know, you've got brand X that posts their corporate content, which is look at our latest product. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. And then there's a hundred employees that are connected to that. And the hundred employees have no engagement whatsoever to what the company's actually doing or what they're saying or what they're talking about. The company's employees aren't brand advocates that are there pushing out and, and explaining things and helping people to understand it better. And I think that starts all the way back from even at the very beginning, right? If you're a small business and you've just started and you're the business owner and you're trying to figure out what's coming next, share that story. It doesn't have to be a prepared film crew, studio-based, high-definition, 4K quality with amazing effects and everything else. Just share who you are. Share why you started your company. Share what you like about it. Explain your products from a point of view as you, the user, the human being, the person, not the profit margins, the latest design features or anything else, right? That's the key to it. And if people can start to bring that across, especially in the early stages when it is just a one-man band or a two-man team or whatever it might be, they can actually take that all the way through to the day that they have 60 members of staff that's 60 people that they are encouraging to get involved with this as well. You know, if you've got a sales team of five people and they're sat there all day, every day, hammering out cold email leads to try and catch people. And we've talked about this before. Think about the effect that has when actually they have a network of potential customers. They're already linked in pretty well. Um, and they, they have that network. Imagine what happens when they start to talk about it from their own personal experiences. Imagine when they talk about it from, why they got involved, why they joined the company, what they think is great about X happening in the industry. All of a sudden, they're creating a whole new level of relationship building without having to do the one-to-one -one meetings. And this is where things have changed. Like we talked about this in a, in a different video for this as well, but the 80s, you had to do one-to-one -one and you had to do it a lot, right? That was the only way to do it. But today, with a good piece of content, you can do one-to-many. And that's a huge difference. This is where you can maximize that impact by having a one-to-many conversation, a one-to-many sharing experience, which ultimately, if you're doing it well enough consistently, then actually eventually you're not cold calling people. People are actually cold emailing you back, as it were, saying, hey, I saw your video about X. It'd be great to have a chat about Y. And then suddenly you're in a whole new conversation. And I think that's what's really important, not focusing on the product, Focusing on, like you said, people um, and, and people like people who are like people, right? It's a terrible phrase, uh, but it's true. And it doesn't take long. So the way that we work is we would spend an hour with the business owner once a month. And from that one hour, we could create an entire month's worth of content. Now, if you've got a sales team, trust me in this. If you've got a sales team and you've got a month's worth of content from the CEO of the company that's going out and supporting their messaging, that sales team is going to be so much more motivated because they've got now all of these assets that they can use 
to point people towards that's supporting the direct outreach that they're doing. An hour a month creates a month's worth of content and your sales team will, will absolutely love it. Also, and again, it's getting that buy-in. So if you're, if you're the CEO of a small business and you've got you know, 10 members of staff, 12 members of staff, if you explain to them that you're going to take the time, the effort to input into this system and that you're asking them to buy into it too, to mm. understand it, to be a part of it, what you're starting to create is a whole network effect for your content to get out there. And I think that's what's really important. Way too many companies, they post the company stuff, none of the team are doing anything with it. And I think at the small stages, you're looking for growth, you're trying to get your messaging out there. It's hard. We talked about this again, you know, what small businesses are, what people can do to support small businesses. But actually any business, it starts from within. So if you're not willing to share your own company's messaging that's going out there, why would anybody else? Right? If your staff doesn't buy into that, why would anybody else? And something that's as simple as you know, a great video from the CEO uh, on LinkedIn that goes up and it's really brief, but it explains exactly why the company was started, what the goals were, what they were trying to achieve, and you know, that real foundational why. Once that's there, your sales team can tag people that they've been speaking to. You, know, you go, hey, James, uh, by the way, Here's the video that I talked about the other day that we were saying, you know, why did uh, Gary start the company or whatever it might be? And all of a sudden, you're giving people real insight and a human to human connection, not B to B, not B to C, because none of that means anything, right? Really, it's just a form of a business model and it's become a real keyword. I'm in B to B sales, great. But reality is, you're in human to human sales, right? You sell to somebody else. There's two people on the side. Well, there's a person on either side of the table, and you're trying to make a deal. So I think having that human element, getting people involved in your network, getting your own employees to buy into it, starting conversations, bringing clients into that mix, bringing your suppliers into that mix, growing through that ability to create content and have one to many conversations is hugely powerful if people are willing to invest in it. And way too often we see CEOs or owners of the businesses retreating and kind of saying, no, no, uh, I'll leave that to marketing. They can create some videos about the business, about the product. We really want to sell more product X. And you're like that, great. You'd sell more product X if people bought into the company as a whole because of the people who are behind it rather than here's my pen, I don't actually own a pen right now. I don't have a pen anywhere uh, to hand. But the idea being that, and I think that's huge. And one last thing that for some reason happened when you lifted up the pen and started talking about it, all I could imagine now is a parody advert uh, in the sort of style of a really nice expensive perfume, but for a pen. I don't know why. It just <laughs> it started going around where you have you know the horses running on the beach and the darkly lit and one thing and another. And then at the end, big. Because <laughs> you always need to write something down. You need to lie down, Chris. That's weird. Thank you. It's, it's okay. I'm like that. I'm okay with that. So, so thinking of that, Chris, we've been exploring repurposing content for the last couple of months. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, sorry. You're waiting for me to say yes. It's a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, it's yes, been loads it's, of fun. It's, it's been, been loads. <laughs> It's been lots of fun. So, so how, how is our repurposing journey evolving? So I think this has been really interesting because the system that we set out originally, and I think it's now been a few months of us doing this, started with the idea that could we create or could we plan out or map out a system whereby one piece of content equals many pieces of content, right? And this is the main principle of repurposing content. What's happened during that journey, and as we've been trying it, like everything, we experiment. So we try something, we want to see how it works out, we look at the results afterwards, we look at how it's all kind of mapped out, and then we say, right, okay, this is how we think we could improve this, let's get to V2, and usually we end up at V152 pretty quickly. What's happened with our social link show is exactly the same thing. The evolution of, could we create one long format piece of content to create lots of smaller pieces of content that we could then use to basically fill a month's worth of content on our social channels and be all based around one thing. I'd say what the evolution of that process has been so far 
is that this month, for example, whilst we're recording this, is that we want to take one large format piece of content. We're not necessarily going to share that one large format piece of content anymore, but we're going to create four smaller videos, which will then have the same knock-on effect, which means each smaller video will have a blog article, which will be written based on that. It will have quote graphics that are created around that conversation. It will have um, some social media short videos that are simple 30 to 60 second clips of what we've talked about. And basically by using that system to pretty much remove any procrastination, which has been really good and really useful, not just for us, but we have started playing around with this system with new clients that we've been talking to recently. It removes any of that procrastination 100% because once we've had this conversation, once we've recorded this video, there is no more what happens next. And I think that's something where I was looking over an, an, old, um, an old survey that was showing basically how many businesses schedule content and plan content in advance and how many uh, are literally doing things off the cuff. And when it comes to small businesses, especially when they're starting, it pretty much comes down to, oh my gosh, I forgot, I haven't tweeted, give me a second. And they go onto Twitter and they'll quickly tweet something. What happens because of that is that life happens, right? So you're about to do that. And just as you open Twitter, the phone rings. So now you're on the phone, you're having a conversation with a client, you're trying to sort something else out that requires you to speak to a supplier. Now you're talking to, and by the end of the day, you've forgotten about any of your content creation. So nothing else is going out. The idea of repurposing content is to take that element away. And I think that's what's really important for most small businesses out there to really realize. If you can create a month's worth of content in the space of one day a month, let's say, all of a sudden you don't have to think about it. All of a sudden you have scheduled content that's happening for you. Your brand is continuously alive and you don't have to worry about those last minute, oh, I haven't tweeted quick. And all that does, and this is something that I think is really important for people to realize, all that does is it creates the foundation level of all your content that doesn't stop you from sharing awesome things that happen on the day, right? This is something that's really important. And a lot of people forget about it. It's not because you've got a tweet going out or a video being shared that that means you can't also share something that you've done today or a new delivery that's just come in or a brand new product that's just happened or that you've just got a sample for anything like that you can share on top of your initial content but what it does stop is from happening that you you spend those two weeks where everything has gone crazy and as business owners we've all been there you spend two weeks you know you're down in the weeds and you just can't get out and above it for for whatever reason and what happens is you come out of those weeds two weeks later and you realize everything's dead right you've lost all any kind of traction that you had you've lost any kind of interest that you were building and literally you've got nothing so you're starting again from scratch after that two weeks three weeks four weeks and it gets worse we've seen companies you know where it happens that it's two weeks where everything was really busy and then you kind of put it back in mind then you go right well we haven't been doing social for a while and then before you know it you're looking at your platforms and realizing you haven't posted anything this year and that becomes a real issue for, for companies because then you really are trying to spool up that, that flywheel from scratch, which is really, really hard to do. And from the repurposing side of things as well, and it's something that I've noticed through doing it for us and for, for our clients, is that there's a continuity of messaging that happens when, when you start repurposing. And repurposing isn't... isn't copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, done. At each point, there's creativity that happens in, in order to make that piece of content anew, basically. But the messaging stays consistent throughout. And one of the issues when you think, oh, I need to tweet or blank paper syndrome, I need to create something from a blank, blank piece of paper, is that over the course of a month, what you're talking about will, will change. And, and from someone that's, that's watching that or consuming that content, it, it can be very confusing. Whereas having a continuous content flow, even if people don't necessarily interact with every single piece of content, particularly on social media channels, it's just tapping on those synapses at the back of the head 
so that when they want to take action, when they're thinking about whatever your service or product is, they know who to contact. That's the whole point of this co- of, of content. It's not for the sake of content. It's so that when a customer, when someone in your ideal audience is in a, a decision-making process and wants to buy, purchase, engage, that you're top of mind. I think that's something that's really important, right? It's when we, we've talked about this in different videos, the idea of sort of the one-to-one sales calls from back in the day, there was no other way of doing that. You had to keep that one-to-one and just keep repeating that pattern again and again and again. Today, the world is very different. People search for stuff that they want to find. They look for things. They spend a lot of time on YouTube watching videos to try and educate them to try and understand what it is that they can learn or what it is they're trying to learn. Having those multiple points of contact with people is huge. And I think that's really important. I'm cutting to that part where you've just do it again and explain yourself. You were saying about people learning stuff online. And uh, so I'm learning how to do Rubik's Cube. Not distracting at all as I try and... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's a screenshot in that so i have no idea what i was saying you really threw me with that which was fantastic but the multiple points of contact are what counts today you might not be starting a sales relationship right now but actually developing that network and building those contacts is a huge part of what we can do today thanks to technology which we just couldn't do before and i think and again i talk about this a lot when we meet people and when we talk to people But you and I met because of your LinkedIn program at the time, uh, the way that you were focusing to try and find new clients and new leads. And we actually ended up being connected, I think, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. Um, So we've known each other now nearly five years. And we have built a relationship based off of it was genuinely a LinkedIn connection request that started that, you know, we find ourselves five years later as business partners what a huge trek that's been um and it's been glorious uh challenging what what word would you use to uh, to describe it serendipitous the amount of time it took you to say something really kind i was going to say it just it's left you speechless it's what the french would call a certain i don't know what um but the idea being Again, it's that really does work. It's gone past the ideas of back in the day where you know you had to have those networking events, you had to go to conferences, etc. Everything's changed in 2020, but it's brought to the forefront just how important building a network is, building a proper network, building a network based on who you actually are, sharing a little bit about who you actually are, creating content that can have that tapping on the window effect, as you call it, whereby people do see you, people do remember who you are, people do remember what you do. And again, you know, I've had people that I haven't worked with for a couple of years message me uh, over the last sort of three, four months as we've been pushing out more and more content and we're doing more and more of these sort of videos because they do remember and they go, oh, actually, yeah, Chris could help with X. And that's what you're looking for, right? When you suddenly, you're, you're in the middle of nowhere and you go, oh, I'm really thirsty, I want to buy a drink. of people will go back to the idea of, yeah, a can of Coke, for example, or a bottle of water, Evian, or whatever it might be. They remember particular brands for a particular situation. And what you're trying to do is make sure that your small business is at the forefront of that thought process. So when somebody says, oh, we need help with our social media, it's not working, we want people to think James and Chris could help with that social link. But social link is almost the secondary part, right? People, People buy from people, ultimately. People buy from people. Is that a Marlon Brando kind of impression? Um, but yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> that's what you're, you're trying to do. And I think people forget that. People want to hide behind their brand and they don't realize the spokesman and the reason why there are huge multi-million dollar deals to put superstars as a, the, the forefront of a brand is because that fundamentally makes more of a difference than just trying to sell the latest 16 blade razor or whatever we're up to nowadays. And if you really, 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 really don't want to 
share your story, get someone else to do it for you. Get someone else to talk about your business because talking about it, interacting like this socially is so much better than pen, buy this pen, you know, add the place to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Get off my back. The idea being that, again, if you're not comfortable, just you in front of a camera, try and create something like this. So within your own team, have a conversation with another member of your team to, to be able to just get a conversation started. You'll be able to clip parts of that out that'll be fantastic and that'll be worthwhile. And the second part is, again, if you can't do that with a team member because you're a small business, ask some of your clients. Ask some of the clients that like you the most and that have worked with you the longest and bring them into the fold and have that conversation with them. It's going to give them exposure, you're getting exposure, and you can just have a natural conversation. Don't overthink it. Don't try and overly complicate it. James, you're in your kitchen, although it looks like you've gone to like a showroom kitchen because that's looking beautiful. Uh, I'm in the house in the south of France, and literally the background is the background. I am where I am. It doesn't have to be anything more than that at this stage. And I think that's what's really important for people to realize. You don't have to have the latest 8K camera. You don't need to have a studio build. You don't need to have a ton of equipment. You don't need any of those things. All of that can come afterwards. But what you can do is boot up your laptop, start your your mobile phone, and just have these conversations and get some content flowing and get your real message of who, who the people are behind the brand get that messaging out there and it's going to have a huge impact. Absolute more. I think that's a perfect place to end. The All About Digital Marketing podcast is brought to you by Social Inc., a distributed digital marketing agency specialized in delivering results through online campaigns. Whether it's content marketing, social media marketing, online advertising or web design, we've got you covered from strategy through to delivery. If you're struggling with your digital marketing, get in touch today by simply visiting www.socialinc.co.